everyone, it's Dr. Custer here. Today we're going to do a video on patient safety. We're going to talk about error prevention and error reporting. So let's get started. Let's start with a case. Ms. K.M. is a 43-year-old African-American female who presents to the office for an exam with the complaint of abdominal pain. She states the pain began two days ago and feels like cramping in her lower abdomen. She also admits to nausea and diarrhea. She says sometimes she can shift position to ease the pain. She points generally to her lower abdomen when asked where the pain is located and denies any radiation. Her past medical history includes irritable bowel syndrome, which has interfered with her work before, endometriosis, which is managed on oral contraceptives, asthma, and osteoarthritis. Surgical, she's had a tonsillectomy, a left knee scope, and a diagnostic laparoscopy for her endo. Her medications include disoclamine, loestrin, albuterol, Advair and Tylenol Extra Strength, and she has no allergies. Her past obstetrical history is uh, G3P2012, just some hyperemesis. GYN history, she has a history of chlamydia that was treated. Like I just said, her endometriosis was diagnosed by laparoscopy 15 years ago and currently is managed by OCPs. And you ask what her LMP is, it's some spotting two weeks ago. Social is negative. So review of systems and other history you'd want to ask. So we gave this lecture during the orientation, so these are things that you would uh, perhaps ponder at this point. All right, let's look at her physical exam. Vital signs, slight systolic hypertension, really unremarkable though. Um, she's in very mild distress. Uh, exam, her abdomen is soft. Um, there's some voluntary guarding, but there's no signs of any peritonitis, and it's pretty diffuse over her lower abdomen. So here's our assessment and plan. What do we do? So we're going to order some blood work, perhaps a urine HCG, excuse me, and a UA in culture. So you did the labs, the, the MA comes in and draws the blood, and you do a urine dip in the lab and UA, and that comes back negative. So you send the culture and the blood work, and you diagnose her with acute viral gastroenteritis. She's instructed to monitor her pain, drink fluids, and rest for a couple of days, and her follow-up is scheduled for one week. And you give her some Zofran for nausea. All right, so meanwhile in your office lab, you have a new medical assistant and she is not really familiar with processes in your office, so she's struggling to keep up with the busy pace. And she accidentally dips the wrong urine for two patients by not checking the sample labels correctly. This oversight is observed by a medical assistant extern, a student who says nothing because she feels afraid to report something. And one of these urine specimens is Ms. KM's. So what happens? That evening, she experiences an acute onset of severe abdominal pain in her right lower quadrant. Um, she goes to the ER. She's promptly taken to surgery and diagnosed with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And the site of the rupture was hemorrhaging rapidly, and she suffered severe hypotension with subsequent anoxia and lifelong disability. All right, so that's the case. This is an example of a patient safety case that can occur in the outpatient setting. So today we're gonna to talk about this. We're gonna talk about general introduction to patient safety, um, different types of error, some critical behaviors that you can do to improve safety, and how to report error. So patient safety, when did this all begin? In 1999, the Institute of Medicine released a report called To Air is Human, Building a Safer Health System. And in this report, they noted that 44,000, 48,000 people died each year in the United States hospital due to medical errors and adverse events. That's a typo there. Errors are caused by faulty system processes and conditions that lead people to make mistakes or fail to prevent them. Note, definition, errors are caused by faulty systems, 
processes and conditions. This was the point in time where the shift was taken from the doctor or the nurse or the clinician and put back to the system and the faulty processes that were in the system. Before then, if there was a bad outcome in a case, you know, people would, the administration would just say, that's a bad doctor, we need to fire that doctor or the nurse or whatever it was. In this report, it really was, you know, recognized that we have to take a step back and look at our systems. So this was the beginning. And this brought attention by the media and became a national priority, patient safety um, in the United States at that time. So here is the Washington Post 2016. Researchers' medical errors are now the third leading cause of death in the United States. So let's look at that. This is a Johns Hopkins research report. And you can see there, medical error is the third leading with 251,454. And this was in 2016 reported. So let's talk about patient safety. We all know about our oath, right? First, do no harm. So according to the World Health Organization, patient safety is the absence of preventable harm to a patient during the process of health care. So preventable harm, that's what we're going to talk about today. Now adverse events are commonplace. You guys will see these throughout your residency in different experiences that you have. 21% um, of Americans report having been personally involved with medical error, and 41% were involved either personally or secondhand. So that's pretty significant. Why do adverse events occur? Like I said before, most cases are not due to willful negligence, but there are some other reasons. Systematic flaws, inadequate communication, widespread process variation, and patient ignorance can all be causes to adverse events. And we're going to talk about that more throughout your patient safety curriculum. Who is responsible then? We don't want to put the blame on necessarily the individual, unless, of course, they were acting in violation. But really, what we need to get here is that this is a team thing. Everyone's responsible. The doctor's taking care of the nurses, the pharmacists, the technicians, the patient, the patient's family. It's everyone is responsible for safe safety in patient care. So we're just going to go through some quick definitions that you guys should be aware of. The first one is adverse event. Adverse event is an event or omission arising during clinical care and causing physical or psychological injury to a patient. An error is defined as a failure to complete a planned action as intended or the use of an incorrect plan of action to achieve a given plan. And then there's near miss, which is a situation in which an event or a mission or sequence arising during clinical care fails to develop further, whether or not as a result of compensating action, thus preventing injury. An example of a near miss would be, let's say the med room is, is not organized right and there's a bunch of bags of meds sitting on the counter and two patients had names, last names that were very similar and it was the end of the shift and the nurse was tired, maybe the lights were low and she or he perhaps grabs the wrong bag, taking it back to the patient's room. If that was given, that would be an adverse event potentially. Well, if it caused harm, if it was not given because that person realized that they had the wrong person's medication before, that would be a near miss. So an adverse drug reaction is any response to a drug that is noxious, unintended, and occurs at doses used for prophylaxis diagnosis or therapy. A medication error is any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of health professional, patient, or consumer. What we were just talking about. Now, sentinel error is any unanticipated event in a healthcare setting resulting in death or serious physical or psychological injury to a patient. And remember, this is not related to the natural course of the patient's illness. 
So examples of sentinel error could be surgery on the wrong body part, surgery on the wrong patient, or the patient receiving the wrong medicine. All right, so let's talk about unsafe acts, errors versus violations. Now, violations are deliberate deviations from proper procedure or rules, whereas errors are unintentional deviations. So if someone perform commits a violation, they purposefully did something out of line with what was the standard, normal, acceptable um, process. Errors, something happened, but it wasn't an intentional deviation. So errors can be broken down into three things. First are slips. So slips are actions that are not carried out as intended or planned. And then lapses are missed actions and omissions. And so let's talk about this. So slips are things that people can actually observe. So for example, forgetting to hit a button on a piece of medical equipment, rendering it set up incorrectly would be a slip. Someone can see that. A lapse is like a memory lapse, attention lapse, where a person missed a step because of being busy or tired. And so that gets into the idea of maximum load. You know, we're all so super busy in healthcare, and it get, sometimes people get to a point where they just they can't remember to do something because their mind is so capacitated. So at capacity, maximum load. Then we have mistakes, which are error brought about by a faulty plan or intention. So a person did an incorrect action but thought it was the correct one, or the action goes as intended, but it was the wrong one to begin with. And then, like I said, violations are deliberate deviations from an operating procedure, standard, or rules. So let's talk about the Swiss cheese model. And you guys remember, we're, we go with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, so if you need more information, go to your IHI modules or the IHI website. So. The Swiss cheese model, sh you can see right here, lines of Swiss cheese with holes. We all know the holes. So if you look at the holes and you think of them, think of the Swiss cheese, the stack, as your patient safety defense system, right? So these are the processes that are in place to minimize potential for patient harm. The holes are either latent conditions or active failures. and what we'll talk about, we'll talk about that in the next slide. And then when you look at the hazards, hazards are things that are unintended, either the hazard is a violation or an error, and with multiple layers of defense, typically these don't occur and turn into a, an active adverse event because you have so many different layers of defenses, as you can see by the Swiss cheese. So here's an example. And here you see um, hazards that now you can see one that lines all the way up with all the Swiss cheese holes. So despite the successful layers of defenses, barriers, and safeguards that are put in place, something just got through because there were latent conditions and then active failures. Now, latent conditions are defects in the design and the organization of process and systems. Things like poor equipment design, um, inadequate training, insufficient resources. Um, these are often unrecognized and or they just become accepted parts of work and this is where people do like workarounds, which we don't want. Latent conditions can lead to active failures. Active failures are errors whose effects are felt immediately. Okay, you guys, so readily apparent if you give someone the wrong medication and they go into an active anaphylactic reaction, that's an active failure. Um, so it's important to remember what each type is. And here's a, here's a clinical example for you guys. So here, the, medic so there, the active failure led to the patient was given the wrong medication. But let's look at some of the latent conditions. Number one, and we just talked about this, the medications were stored close together. They weren't set up in a, in a clearly demarcated way. Um, the med room was dark. Maybe the light bulb was out and, the, and they couldn't, you know, the maintenance guy couldn't get there yet. Um, the time of the day makes a big difference, you know, if it's the end of the shift and the nurse is tired and rushing, you know, that could be a, a defect in that, in that defense. 
And then so what happens with all these latent conditions, they add up and the nurse selects the wrong medication, which is the active failure, and the patient's given the wrong medication. So here we see um, it begins with the patient's allergy history is not obtained. We always get allergy history, right? But for whatever reason that day, it wasn't obtained. Then the physician writes, or the prescriber writes an order for a medication, which the patient is allergic, not realizing that the allergy wasn't obtained, perhaps. The pharmacist goes to fill it and fails to double check the patient allergy status, and then the nurse gives the patient a drug to which he or she is allergic, and the patient arrests and dies. So there's our active failure, and there's our latent condition. All right, let's talk about responding to errors and harm. So we're gonna talk about building a culture of safety. And we're gonna talk a little bit about blame versus accountability. So a just culture holds individuals to account for reckless behavior while also recognizing that people make mistakes and aren't responsible for system failures. So rather than blaming bad doctors or bad nurses, we need to all take a step back and be accountable for having a safe system. And this is all about culture of safety. If everyone worked together as a team to ensure that patient safety was the top priority at all aspects of care, we could really build up a healthcare setting where, where we really reduce um, medical error. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna learn from adverse events. So how do we build a culture of safety? This one concept is pretty important. It's psychological safety. Um, so in a setting with psychological safety, people know that their concerns will be open, openly received and treated with respect. So this is about being able to share your ideas to make things better or change things and know that you won't be shot down or you know, condemned or whatever, that your ideas will be openly received and treated with respect. Active leadership is also very important. It's important that leaders actively create an environment where all staff are comfortable expressing their concerns. If the setting at the, or the environment of the workplace is one where people fear persecution by the leadership, then they're not going to feel safe and they're not going to contribute and they're not going to report error. Transparency is very important. Every patient safety problem needs to be dealt with, not swept under the rug, which traditionally has been done. It's important that team members have a high degree of confidence that the organization will learn from the problems and use st staff feedback to improve the system. And with this transparency, people will use the proper reporting mechanisms and errors will be dealt with accordingly. And then fairness. People need to know that this is not, they're not gonna be punished or blamed for system-based errors. People need to be honest and report things. And that's how building a culture of safety is done. All right, so that's how we build a culture of safety. Now let's talk about four critical behaviors to improve safety. And it's really important that you guys really understand this stuff and apply it. Number one is you follow safety protocols. These are protocols that are put in place to prevent error. For example, universal precautions or hand hygiene protocols. You know, these are put in place so, you know, infection isn't spread and so patients remain safe and you remain safe. The next thing is speak up. And this is really hard, especially as a young resident. And, I, and we understand that, but if you see something, you need to say something. And we call this these crucial conversations. If you see an unsafe working condition, even if it's a close call, especially any adverse event, it's important that you either speak up and say something to someone you trust at the place where you're at or that you do the anonymous reporting at that place. And we'll talk about reporting in a minute. Three, you need to listen. It's imperative to listen to patient and family concerns about safety. This is interesting, but if a patient, patients know their body, p families know their patient much more than you do. If the patient is telling you something's not right and the family's telling you something's not right, please look into it. Don't just assume that 
that it's, it's not a concern that you need to look into. So the Joint Commission has new communication standards, and this is really important to know. It's important to listen to and honor patient and family perspectives and choices, identify a patient and family's knowledge, values, beliefs, and cultural background, and then encourage them to participate in the care and decision making at the level they choose. This is what we want to do. So these are things that, that accreditation agencies are requiring, and just as a doctor, a compassionate doctor, you have anyway, right? But it's important to do this. And the fourth thing is take care of yourself. When you go to work and you're not feeling your best, that can lead to patient harm. If you're worried, if your anxiety is high, and you're not sleeping well, you're, you're going to be tired. It's not going to be good for the patients. Please seek, seek some help if any of these situations are occurring. You know, an unhealthy level of stress can degrade performance and lead to physician burnout. And we talk a lot about burnout. But you guys, if you start to feel like you're just severely exhausted, you're losing your passion, you're, you're not happy with the patients, um, if you come, become more inefficient, this is things that we need to talk about and let us know. So these are the, f the four things that you can do to improve safety and really take care of yourself. So back to self-care, here are some absolutes. Use self-restraint and try not to overextend yourself. These are both very important. If you're the kind of person who has a quick temper and you recognize that, you're going to have to work on that because you have to have patience with your patients. Um, the, other, the other thing is overextending yourself. If you're a yes person and you're a people pleaser and you just say yes to everything, you're going to be bogged down so quickly and burn out. And you don't want to do that. Set your limits. Know your rules, boundaries, and limitations and apply them. Take daily timeouts for exercise, yoga, meditation, whatever it is that heal your body, help your mind feel better. You know, I tell the residents, sometimes, you know, you can't get time to do this, but we're a community-based program. We're all driving everywhere. In the morning time when it's dark, I don't have any music on, and that's my time to think and meditate, and it works. Make time to connect with friends and family in a meaningful way. This is very important as well. Relationships, relationships. We need to stay connected with those who love us and those that we love. And do not ignore your body. Please, sleep. Sleep every day. Make sure you eat. Don't skip meals because you're busy. Drink water. And if you're not experiencing joy or happiness in your life every day, you need to ask for help. Authority Health has a employee assistance program that is free and available to all of you. You can talk to the Human Resource Director for that information if you need it. You guys all know you can reach out to me, your Program Director, Coordinator. Any of us would be willing to talk to you if you needed help. All right, so let's quickly go through reporting strategies and then we'll be done. So let's say you see something happen. What do you do? You know, if you feel comfortable, you can report the error to either your preceptor and attending another person in the healthcare team, um, your program director or the director of medical education. Every site has a different reporting situation, so you'll have to know the process for the system that you're working in. Anonymous, anonymous reporting is available everywhere. Um, we do have an anonymous reporting option at Authority Health, and the website is listed there. And that can be used for any complaint. You can use it for any sort of event that you would like the GME department to know about anonymously, but you don't want to personally report. So please use that link if you need to. Detroit Medical Center has an incident report webpage. If you guys want, you can look into that. That's a pretty comprehensive example of a uh, anonymous report, and you can report anything from an adverse event to medication error to just anything really. So I'm sure you all have been trained to use that at St. John Providence, I'm sure has the same system. So get to know your hospital specific reporting strategy system. All right, so real quick, back to the case. So what could have been done in the case of Ms. KM's missed ectopic pregnancy? Let's see, what do we think? Well, anytime you're, you're overwhelmed at work, you know, speaking to management is always a good thing. So perhaps the new MA could have spoken to management 
about her her position she was in. Now remember the whole concept of culture of safety and psychological safety. Some places people aren't comfortable reporting or asking for help because of the culture that is in the organization. So if you have a safe place, people will feel free to come and ask for help. You know, the MA extern who witnessed the mistake could have spoken up immediately um, to let her know that she committed an error. Overall, you know, creation of processes to ensure safer practices could always be applied. Um, you know, perhaps you need to have a, a sign up that shows the process for, for ensuring to look at the label, whatever would work for your practice. Training people in the importance of, of safety. So here we go, checklist for new staff. Um, maybe a dedicated lab AMA would cut down on, you know, if the lab's really busy, if the practice is busy. Um, and then regular staff meetings to encourage a culture of safety, like I just said. So just having an open environment where people can share rather than being afraid. So conclusion, everyone on the care team must be both diligent and vigilant for this stuff, you guys. Follow the critical behaviors in your practice of medicine. Follow your safety protocols. Speak up if you see something. Listen to your patients and take care of yourself. Remember those crucial conversations and use your reporting systems routinely. Care cannot become safer unless errors are made apparent. And that's so important. That's what I want you guys to take from this. So thanks for listening. You guys can send me an email or text at any time. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.